Hello and welcome to Game Set. Once again, it's time to take a look at some more games that grab the console that they run on by the throat and make them scream. Well, actually, I guess you can't really scream very well if you're being grabbed by the throat, but anyway, these games do things that most other games on that same console don't do. So to me, that makes them interesting. You know, from that point of view, it doesn't mean they're great games or anything. Anyway, first up, let's take a look at what the Super Nintendo can do 3D-wise without the help of any add-on chip. Here's Wolfenstein 3D on the Super NES from Imagineer. This is a port of the early PC corridor shooter to the console. Now, while you may think this looks awful, and well, it sorta does, just keep in mind that the hardware it's running on here. This is the Super Nintendo, whose CPU only runs at 3.58 megahertz. The minimum spec PC to run this game was a 286 over five megahertz with over 512K of RAM, which is four megabits in console terms. The Super NES only has 128K of RAM, which is one megabit. Not only that, but there are no special chips helping out this game at all. This is completely stock Super Nintendo. Now you might also be saying to yourself, well, the Super Nintendo has Mode 7 built in, so that helps a little with all this scaling. Nope. Well, I mean, the console does have Mode 7, but that's not being used in this game. Mode 7 can only scale a single plane of graphics and not individual walls and sprites like this game does. This is all being done in software here, and all things considered, I'm fairly impressed. Everything scales well, even if it's pretty darn pixely sometimes. Well, a lot of the time. The game runs between 10 and 15 frames per second. I would love to let today's PC gamers try to play this and watch them have an absolute meltdown over the frame rate. They're just not equipped to deal with it. I think that I'd find their misery very entertaining. But even with that frame rate, the game here is quite playable. Basically, you're on a quest to shoot down a bunch of Nazis. Of course, the game being on a Nintendo console, all references to Nazis have been removed. There's some pretty crappy music in this version, which is almost laughable at times. Still, the fact that this game exists on this console without any extra hardware helping out is amazing to me. Stop! Stop! Go The original Crash Bandicoot on the PlayStation was a pretty darn good looking game. Yeah, it was mostly on rails, but that allowed the visuals to be pretty nice. It really was cutting edge back when it came out. Crash Bandicoot 2 came out a year later. It looks a little better, maybe a few more polygons on the screen? It's really hard to tell as it basically looks like more of the first game for the most part. It did add some really nice looking reflections to some parts though. But Crash Bandicoot Warped, also known as Crash Bandicoot 3, really improved things. It runs at the same horizontal resolution as the previous games, which is 512 pixels wide and 240 pixels tall. Most games of this time were 320 pixels wide by 240 tall. And like the previous games, it still runs at 30 frames per second. However, now there's much more that they're able to put on the screen. For instance, the draw distance is way better. Everything isn't hidden by foliage anymore and you can really see far into the distance, up to 10 times as far as the previous games in some cases. It really is incredible to see the series evolve on a single console like this. According to Andy Gavin, one of the founders of Naughty Dog, the first Crash game was only ever to put about 800 polygons on the screen at once. That number seems extraordinarily low to me, but I didn't make the game, so I don't know. For the sequels, they were able to push that number to 1300, which makes a pretty big difference. You also won't notice a lot of texture warping in any of the games. Texture warping is a common flaw in many games on the console, as you can see here in this fine example from the heralded game known as Twisted Metal 2 from Single Track. There are plenty of other less obvious things going on under the hood that may not make you stand up and scream at the witchcraft going on in your PlayStation, but it's happening. Stuff like data decompression and streaming as the levels are significantly larger than the amount of RAM in the console. Oh, and the physics engine, which makes things very cartoon-like in the way that they move. As a game, I've got to admit that I'm not a huge Crash fan. I liked it way more back in the day. But there's no denying some of the tricks that they were able to pull off here make the game look super nice.
This is Amok on the Saturn from Scavenger. In the last episode of Pushing Hardware Limits, I talked about a Game Boy Advance game that used voxels, so why not a Saturn game as well? And that's exactly what Amok does. Aside from a bunch of sprites scattered about the level as well as your craft which is made up of polygons, this game is rendered entirely with voxels. These pixels that exist in 3D space certainly have a unique look to them. They also move extremely smoothly as well, and I've not noticed any slowdown or drop frames at all while playing this game. But hey, that's Scavenger for you. They were pretty good. As a game, it's okay. You pilot your thing around to accomplish different mission objectives which are spelled out for you. Your craft can go underwater as well as on land. The only thing it can't do, apparently, is go anywhere during the daytime. The biggest drawback of the game is definitely how dark it is. But the voxels are cool, and the soundtrack by Jesper Kidd is excellent as always. fighting games were known to push what consoles could do back when they were first introduced, so let's check out a few. But before that, let's give a little love to a Genesis game that people don't seem to talk about very much. Ranger X on the Genesis from Gao Entertainment deserves at least a brief mention. This little mech game is quirky but fun once you get the hang of it. Each stage is introduced by some wireframe graphics, which is cool even if it's fairly crude wireframe. The stages themselves all look pretty nice. I read in the gaming magazines back in the day that this one squeezes out a few more on-screen colors than the Genesis is normally able to put on screen simultaneously. I can't count the colors, but it seems pretty normal looking to me. I mean, it looks really good, but if there are any more colors here, I certainly can't tell. The only part where I could maybe see this happening is this section here where there are some spotlights which, if you notice, aren't a dithered mess, or I mean mesh. They take advantage of the rarely used highlight function of the console to achieve this and that can actually give more colors on screen. I like how some areas darken or brighten depending on where you're at. Down here in the trees it's pretty dark, but up in the sky it's much brighter so the camera has to adjust the exposure. Same for when you emerge from behind these walls in this factory place. I also really like the reflections of the city in the glass windows of this building in this stage. Or the cool polygon-like depth created by the scrolling here as you move back and forth past these tunnels. It's not as complex as it looks though, as it's just line scrolling of the floor and ceiling. Pretty simple. This stage makes you feel like you're in a cylinder shaped area and it's done pretty well. Again, it's line scrolling, but it has two different background layers doing different line scrolling at the same time. I like it. I enjoy the effects that this game offers and I recommend trying it out because it's a fun game too. How about Tekken 3 on the PlayStation? The Tekken games kept getting better and better in their presentation throughout their lives, and Part 3 here was the last one on the PlayStation. Tekken 1 was decent for its time, though pretty blocky looking. The characters also didn't have much detail, but the game moved at 60 frames per second. Tekken 2 came along and the ground looked a lot less blocky and everything just looked better. The characters still had a tendency to show off how few polygons that they were made out of though. Still, overall it was a nice improvement. Tekken 3 really ups the ante. Not only are the backgrounds, floor, and the characters themselves all improved, but the game doubles the vertical resolution to 480 pixels tall instead of the usual 240 or 224. As a result, the entire game runs in interlaced mode. Unfortunately, the horizontal resolution wasn't increased. In fact, it was lowered from 512 pixels wide to 384, but that's still more horizontal resolution than most games of this era ran at. Compared to Tekken 2, it's still a gain. For example, Tekken 1 and 2 rendered 122,800 pixels per frame, whereas Tekken 3 does 184,320 per frame. That's a 50% increase of pixels, so not bad. And yes, the game still runs at 60 frames per second. Unfortunately, since the game is interlaced, we don't really get to see all 480 horizontal lines at once, so that kind of does negate it a bit. Oh well, it's still cool. And yes, I think the game's pretty fun as well. It's also the first Tekken game to feature an alternative mode in the form of Tekken Force. This one is a very basic beat-em-up where you scroll along, beating up random bad guys who all look the same. 
Eventually you make it to the boss, which is another character from the game. You have a limited amount of time to defeat them. Overall, pretty nice, and Namco pushed about as hard as I think they could. A more impressive PlayStation game might be Tobal No. 1 from Squaresoft and Dream Factory. This 3D fighter has an even higher resolution running at 512 by 480. Of course, as you can see, there's no texture mapping whatsoever. Everything looks plain and simple, but I'll be honest with you, I really like how this looks. Everything also moves at 60 frames per second, or fields per second since obviously it's interlaced. It's a bit of an odd fighting game, but I still like how it plays. You have high, middle, and low attacks. The circle button doesn't do anything, L1 jumps and runs, and R1 guards. The game works similar to Virtual Fighter with its ring out system. This is a fun game to play with some great music, and these graphics are sharp. <laughs> Even better is Tobal 2, also on the PlayStation. This one was only ever released in Japan because we just didn't deserve it here. They improved everything they could with this one. This game still runs at a crisp 512 by 480 in interlaced mode. It still runs at 60 fields per second. But now the character models have been improved a lot and there's even some texture mapping on the floors and environments. What's more is that these textures don't warp very much at all, which is extremely rare on this console. Actually, if you play the weird quest mode, there is some more significant texture warpage, but yeah, let's pay attention to the fighting part of the game. The characters are still mostly untextured, but you'd never even think about it looking at them. There is a bit of light texturing on some of them though, like this chicken dude I'm fighting here. Gone are all of the hard angles and edges that they had in the first game. Everything is more rounded with the Gowrod shading that makes things look smooth. Even the camera is better and it doesn't weirdly start panning around your characters like it did in the first game. I even think that the fighting system is at least slightly improved as it felt a bit less sluggish. Not that the first one was bad or anything. You can just tell that they learned a few things from making the first game. Gotta tell you, these graphics look insanely bright and sharp on a CRT. I'm super happy that they have a great game in here as well. The music is once again really good, so this is a total package. It's truly a shame that this one didn't come out in the West. I couldn't imagine a game performing this well back when I first got the system. How about Motor Tune Grand Prix? Wait, what? This game is just a combat racer with no extra frills, right? Well, yeah, but the unlockable tank combat minigame runs at the PlayStation's maximum resolution of 640x480. Sure, the playfield is pretty sparse, but I'll attribute that to being an early game. But boy, is it sharp. Basically, you need to kill three opponents per stage to advance. Once you're killed three times, it's game over. Not a bad little minigame. There's also IS Internal Section from Squaresoft. This was only ever released in Japan. This is another game that runs at 640x480, but at least it's a little bit more visually complex. Maybe. You move through the tubes and shoot down stuff. Reminds me of a cross between Tempest and Virtual Hamster. Honestly, it gets boring pretty fast, as there's not a lot of variety here. There are other games on the PlayStation that run at 640x480, but these are the only two that I could find which seems to be at least doing something interesting or 3D with the visuals. Longtime viewers will remember way back when I talked about Wolfenstein 3D on the Super Nintendo about 14 or 15 minutes ago. But now let's check out a Genesis game that's pushing some 3D without any kind of additional hardware. Not like Genesis games tended to have add-on chips anyway. Anyway, there are other games on the console that do push polygons, but 
None quite as fast or as well as this one, maybe. This is Kawasaki Superbike Challenge on the Genesis from Domark. Here's a motorcycle game where you ride a Kawasaki Superbike and it's a challenge. There ain't no lame ass Suzuki's, Yamaha's, Honda's, BMW's, or Ducati's up in here. Give me some of that Kawasaki lovin'. Anyway, as you can see, this game features lots of flat shaded polygons and they move surprisingly well here. The game runs pretty fast, a lot faster than most other polygon games on the console. In fact, it can reach up to 20 frames per second in some cases. There's plenty of polygonal structures around each track. These tracks are real life circuits by the way, they're completely indistinguishable from the real thing. Not only that, but the motorcycle windshield makes use of the console's shadow function instead of relying on dithering. I also like how when you turn, the world rotates slightly, including the detail on the horizon. It's a nice touch. As a game, it's not bad at all. The control is good and it doesn't feel like there's a ton of lag like other games with polygons from this era. I do tend to get hung up on these arch things a lot though. You'd think they'd have proper height clearance, but I guess lopping off a racer's head isn't really a concern of the Superbike World Championship. There's a qualifying race on each track, but you don't really need to do it. If you finish at least one lap of the qualifying race and then quit, you'll be placed whatever rank you were when you quit. It sounds easy, but one wrong move can cost you significantly. I do wish there was a bit more variety in the tracks, but real life circuits tend to look similar and kind of boring. I also wish that they gave the Z80 processor something to do and offered the option for some nice music to listen to as you race. Oh well, it's not a bad game and it's actually quite impressive for the time. Here's Winter Gold on the Super Nintendo developed by Funcom and published by Nintendo themselves in 1996. This game was only ever released in Europe. It also uses the Super FX2 chip, so yes, that's cheating, but it's still really interesting as far as Super FX2 visuals go. You have six different events to play, downhill skiing, snowboarding, aerial skiing, bobsled, ski jump, and the luge. Since this game is not officially licensed by the Olympics or anything like that, you can choose from one of three different cities. There's Salt Lake City in the US, Albertville in France, not Alabama, and Lillehammer in Norway. A fourth city can also be unlocked. Salt Lake City is almost always mostly clear with lots of whites, blues, and a touch of snow. Albertville is more of a washed out gray with a lot of snow going on. And Lillehammer is always orange and purple as they only do their winter sports at sunset, or maybe at sunrise, only the developers know for sure. I like how when selecting the cities, the US has pictures of a cowboy and a space shuttle and other cool things but the other two countries only have a picture of their flag and maybe some mountains. That's all they're known for. Go USA! That's right, I like my country, what you gonna do about it? Anyway, it really doesn't matter which city you pick as all the courses all seem exactly the same. If there's actually any difference other than the colors, it certainly isn't noticeable. The flat shaded polygons all move pretty fast, though it does kind of give off a streaming vibe. By that I mean it's more like an FMV game where you just react to what's there and nothing really changes much. It still looks cool though. If you wreck, it has canned cutaways that I don't think are rendered on the fly, but they still look cool. Gameplay wise, it's okay. Not horrible or anything, and it's good for a few plays if you have some friends over. Some of the events seem pretty tough, like the ski jump. Landing properly is more difficult than it looks. Some events start with a moving meter or bar that I don't fully understand. There's nothing you can do here and pressing buttons doesn't seem to make any difference whatsoever. It's not like these scenes can be controlled anyway. I do like the dancing girl at the start of the game, because obviously that's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of winter sports. Still looks cool though and obviously some rotoscoping or motion capture was involved, probably the former. This game is definitely interesting visually and I'm surprised that it didn't get released in North America. But at the same time, I don't think it would have been a huge hit had it been. Since we talked about some PlayStation Fighters earlier, let's take a look at 3 on the Saturn, beginning with Virtua Fighter 2. When this arcade port was released on the console, it blew everyone away. Nobody thought that the system could do what you're looking at here. It was so far above and beyond the first game that was included with the system, it wasn't even funny. First of all, it runs at a resolution of 704 pixels wide by 480 tall. 
That's 64 more horizontal pixels than the PlayStation can even do, or 30,720 more pixels per frame, all running at 60 frames per second. Well, once again, fields per second since it's forced to display in interlaced mode. It looks super crisp, if a bit shimmery on a CRT monitor, but it still looks great upscaled here with the Retro Tink 5X. I've never felt any slowdown with this game, though sometimes polygons do flicker or disappear briefly. While it doesn't match the arcade, it's amazing how close they were able to come, and it even runs at over 2 frames per second faster. Two more frames make it that much closer to real life! Five, two, ready, go! <laughs> Now, let's look at Fighting Vipers. This uses a similar, if not the same engine as Virtua Fighter 2. That means you get the same 704 by 480 resolution running interlaced at 60 fields per second. Super sharp stuff. However, this game is definitely stressing the Saturn more than Virtua Fighter 2 did. How's that? Well, in this game, you fight inside a caged arena. In a few of the stages, the walls have a tendency to disappear into nothingness as if it's too much to keep on screen. Generally though, it's not bad at all. Also, the game does exhibit some slowdown here and there as the Saturn is being pushed a bit harder than it can take. I'm still impressed with what they were able to achieve here though. It's a cool fighter which is quite enjoyable. However, I feel that the characters aren't quite as memorable. Lastly, let's check out Last Bronx. Get it? Lastly? Last Bronx? Yeah, never mind. This one is a weapons-based fighter. In fact, it's kind of like a dollar store Soul Calibur. Once again, it uses a similar, if not the same exact engine as Virtua Fighter 2. Same high resolution, same interlacing, same frame rate. And like Fighting Vipers, it has the same controls as Virtua Fighter 2. This one has borders around the fighting area similar to Fighting Vipers, but they're much further away from where the action begins. There can still be some flickering problems as well. The slowdown from Fighting Vipers also makes a triumphant return, so you know the Saturn's being pushed to its knees here. But what makes this game stand out a bit is that two of the stages have ceilings. They look cool and they're handled pretty well given the limitations of the console and this particular engine. The Saturn has two visual display processors, or VDPs. VDP2 is responsible for the flat stuff, like the floors and ceilings in games like this. What's cool is that they can stretch out to infinity. That's what's being done here, and while it doesn't match up perfectly with the other objects in the background, it's still a pretty nice looking effect. The Saturn has lots of other high resolution fighting games, but I feel that these three were the ones worth mentioning in this episode. Long tree. Fight. Well, there you go. Those are some more games that do some special things in one way or the other on the consoles that they run on. How about you? Do you know of any games that do some nifty things that you didn't expect? Please let me know because I want to check them out. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Do you want a game that pushes the Genesis system by Sega into submission? Then you need Will Harvey Presents Zany Golf for the 16-bit Sega Genesis. E. O. A. Trip Hawkins hates it when I say that, and I do know better, but... Your Genesis will struggle to keep up with all the power of this game! Yeah! Zany action! Nice! Zany detail! Whoa! Zany sound! This game is way too zany for the Genesis! Zany golf! Thanks, Will Harvey, for destroying my Genesis with all of this power!